University of Cambridge International Examinations International General Certificate of Secondary Education November Examination Session, 2013 English as a Second Language Extended Tier Listening Comprehension Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the test. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the test. Teacher, please give out the question papers, and when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you are all ready, here is the test. Look at questions 1 to 6. For each question, you will hear the situation described as it is on your exam paper. You will hear each item twice. Questions 1 to 6 For questions 1 to 6, you will hear a series of short sentences. Answer each question on the line provided. Your answer should be as brief as possible. You will hear each item twice. Question 1 when should the family go to their car? Attention all passengers. Please note that the people parked on the lower level need to go to their vehicles at once. These vehicles will be allowed off the boat before those on the upper level. OK, that's us. We're on the lower level. Let's make our way to the car now. Follow me and be careful of the staircase. It's very steep. Attention all passengers. Please note that the people parked on the lower level need to go to their vehicles at once. These vehicles will be allowed off the boat before those on the upper level. OK, that's us. We're on the lower level. Let's make our way to the car now. Follow me and be careful of the staircase. It's very steep. Question 2. What weather conditions should Mustafa expect on the drive to see his father? Mustafa, did you hear the weather forecast for today? They said that this good weather might change. I hope the conditions will be OK. I'm planning to drive over to see my dad later on tonight. Well, take care. They're predicting very strong winds for the evening. Mustafa, did you hear the weather forecast for today? They said that this good weather might change. I hope the conditions will be OK. I'm planning to drive over to see my dad later on tonight. Well, take care. They're predicting very strong winds for the evening. Question 3. Which two problems do the friends face? Going to the motor racing sounds like a great idea, Joe. But how will we get the money to go? We can try to earn some. I'll ask my dad if he'll give us some work at his factory. Oh, it's not just the money, though, is it? We're supposed to be at college that day. You worry too much. We'll find a way and get there somehow. Going to the motor racing sounds like a great idea, Joe. But how will we get the money to go? We can try to earn some. I'll ask my dad if he'll give us some work at his factory. Oh, it's not just the money, though, is it? We're supposed to be at college that day. You worry too much. 
We'll find a way and get there somehow. Question 4. At what time will the musicians be on stage tonight? We need to leave at 5 o'clock, Samira. We should be at the concert hall by 8 p.m. That's when they will let everyone in. OK. I'll be at your house by 4 then. That gives us plenty of time for any last-minute arrangements. Great. Just imagine. At 9 o'clock tonight, we'll finally get to watch the band we've waited to see for months. We need to leave at 5 o'clock, Samira. We should be at the concert hall by 8 p.m. That's when they will let everyone in. OK. I'll be at your house by 4 then. That gives us plenty of time for any last-minute arrangements. Great. Just imagine. At 9 o'clock tonight, we'll finally get to watch the band we've waited to see for months. Question 5. What was the score of the game at half-time? How did you get on at the game today, Abdu? It was quite exciting, actually. There were no goals in the first half, but in the second half, we scored four times to win the game easily. Sounds like you needn't have gone until after half-time, then. How did you get on at the game today, Abdu? It was quite exciting, actually. There were no goals in the first half, but in the second half, we scored four times to win the game easily. Sounds like you needn't have gone until after half-time, then. Question 6. Which two pieces of advice does the doctor give to Maya? Hello, Maya. What can I do for you today? I've been struggling with aches and pains in my legs for the past few days, Doctor. I think it's because I'm over-exercising. But I thought that exercise was good for you. Hmm. Exercise is good for you, Maya. But for the time being, I think you should stop the exercise until we can find out what's wrong. Uh, I'd better take a look, please. Uh, before I see you again, I suggest you take some painkillers and see if they make a difference. Hello, Maya. What can I do for you today? I've been struggling with aches and pains in my legs for the past few days, Doctor. I think it's because I'm over-exercising. But I thought that exercise was good for you. Hmm. Exercise is good for you, Maya, but for the time being, I think you should stop the exercise until we can find out what's wrong. Uh, I'd better take a look, please. Uh, before I see you again, I suggest you take some painkillers and see if they make a difference. That is the last of questions one to six. In a moment, you will hear question 7. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 7. Listen to the following interview with a woman who is setting up a new business project, and then complete the details below. You will hear the interview twice. We're here today with Imelda Jarmusch at her new shop. Hello, Imelda. I believe that you're due to open for business tomorrow. Yes, that's right. I'm a little nervous, but excited too. It must have taken a lot of planning and preparation to get to this stage, Imelda. Have you had any previous experience of setting up a business? No, none at all. This is a completely new project for me. I've been putting in lots of hours over the last six months and doing a lot of learning. You must have plenty of energy, but you must also be very tired. 
Absolutely, yes, I'm really tired. And I've been living on a diet of coffee and burgers for the last few weeks. Oh dear. Well, I do hope things settle down for you after tomorrow and you can eat normally. <laughs> Now, Imelda, please tell us what your business is all about. It consists of two parts, really. In the shop, we'll be selling gifts, such as those shoulder bags over there and the wooden giraffes in the corner. But also, we're running a sort of travel agency. Oh, that's unusual. Is there a link between the two, then? I mean, the items for sale and the travel? Well, I run the shop, but my business partner, Stefan, is managing the travel agency. The idea is that the goods we're selling highlight interesting places to visit, and that creates a desire to travel to those places. And that's where Stefan comes in. Mm. What type of holidays is he offering? Activity and exploration. So it's not really the sun and beach crowd that we're trying to attract. Who came up with the plan, Imelda? Both of us, really. I was in Sri Lanka last year and met Stefan there. He was working as a tour guide for a group of people from Belgium, and we got talking about going into business together. And how did you finance the business? Uh, we both had some savings, so we put 25% each into the business, and then we borrowed the remaining £30,000 from the bank. Was that the toughest part, getting the money from the bankers? Not really, no. We had a good business plan, and we presented it confidently. I think the toughest part was getting the shop ready. What would you like to achieve by the end of your first year? We hope to have sold at least 1,000 items, and we also hope to have organised at least two trips a month. It's a lot of work, Imelda. Will you be employing anyone to help? Yes, we have two people working for us, one to help in the shop on a part-time basis and another to take care of the travel arrangements. Is there any chance of you and Stefan swapping places? I mean, you leading the trips abroad and Stefan working here in the shop. Oh, yes, definitely. We are taking it in turns to do the travelling. I'm not interested in standing behind a sales desk all the time. I also need an active life. Now you will hear the interview again. We're here today with Imelda Jarmusch at her new shop. Hello, Imelda. I believe that you're due to open for business tomorrow. Yes, that's right. I'm a little nervous, but excited too. It must have taken a lot of planning and preparation to get to this stage, Imelda. Have you had any previous experience of setting up a business? No, none at all. This is a completely new project for me. I've been putting in lots of hours over the last six months and doing a lot of learning. You must have plenty of energy, but you must also be very tired. Absolutely, yes, I'm really tired. And I've been living on a diet of coffee and burgers for the last few weeks. Oh dear. Well, I do hope things settle down for you after tomorrow and you can eat normally. <laughs> Now, Imelda. Please tell us what your business is all about. It consists of two parts, really. In the shop, we'll be selling gifts, such as those shoulder bags over there and the wooden giraffes in the corner. But also, we're running a sort of travel agency. Oh, that's unusual. Is there a link between the two, then? I mean, the items for sale and the travel? Well, I run the shop but my business partner, Stefan, is managing the travel agency. The idea is that the goods we're selling highlight interesting places to visit, and that creates a desire to travel to those places. And that's where Stefan comes in. Mm. What type of holidays is he offering? Activity and exploration. So it's not really the sun and beach crowd that we're trying to attract. Who came up with the plan, Imelda? Both of us, really. 
I was in Sri Lanka last year and met Stefan there. He was working as a tour guide for a group of people from Belgium, and we got talking about going into business together. And how did you finance the business? Uh, we both had some savings, so we put 25% each into the business, and then we borrowed the remaining £30,000 from the bank. Was that the toughest part, getting the money from the bankers? Not really, no. We had a good business plan, and we presented it confidently. I think the toughest part was getting the shop ready. What would you like to achieve by the end of your first year? We hope to have sold at least 1,000 items, and we also hope to have organised at least two trips a month. It's a lot of work, Imelda. Will you be employing anyone to help? Yes, we have two people working for us, one to help in the shop on a part-time basis and another to take care of the travel arrangements. Is there any chance of you and Stefan swapping places? I mean, you leading the trips abroad and Stefan working here in the shop. Oh, yes, definitely. We are taking it in turns to do the travelling. I'm not interested in standing behind a sales desk all the time. I also need an active life. That is the end of question 7. In a moment you will hear question 8. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 8. Listen to the following interview with a man who lives on a boat, and then complete the details below. You will hear the interview twice. We're here this morning in the south of France with Marcel Beno. Marcel lives on a boat. Hello there, and thank you for offering to show us your home on water. Hello. Welcome aboard. How long have you been living on your boat, Marcel? For the last five and a half years. I've owned several smaller boats in my life, but eight years ago I decided to sell my house and live full-time on the water. It took me a while to get things organised, though. What type of boat is this, then? It's called a motor cruiser. It can be used on rivers and canals, and also out at sea. So, from where we are now in the south of France, you can go inland up to Paris, but you could also sail across the Mediterranean and end up in Africa. That's right, yes. In fact, I was in Cyprus last week. It took me four days to get back. The inside of the boat seems larger than it looks from the outside. So, where we are now, what's this section called? This is the cockpit, where we steer the boat. But where we can also enjoy the sights and the sea breeze. It does feel great out here in the open on a sunny day like today. How fast does the boat travel, Marcel? Quicker than you think. It has a modern electronic 300 kilowatt engine, which can propel the boat at up to 34 knots. That's the speed measurement we use for water. That equates to about 64 kilometers per hour on land. What other technology does it have? The boat has a satellite communication system, so I always know exactly where I am at sea. And it has a digital depth finder, so I don't get stuck on the riverbed anywhere. <laughs> and what about things that make life comfortable for you? It has a high-definition television, built-in MP3 player with speakers, central heating, and even air conditioning for when I'm in hot places. What about when you are out at sea for days or even weeks at a time? I can store 825 litres of water and 910 litres of fuel. 
that's enough for more than a month's cruising. And I can see that you have a refrigerator, a gas cooker, and even a normal electricity supply, just as you would see in a house. Yes, when I'm back in harbour, I just plug in a cable, and that gives me constant electricity. The boat has four batteries, though, so when I'm out on the water, I rely on those. They are rechargeable. The gas is just a portable bottle, like the ones you use for camping. What about the social side of things? Doesn't it get lonely? No, not really. In each harbour or marina, if you are using rivers and canals, there is a lively community of people just like me. The harbours and marinas have shops, restaurants, and other places to relax. At this harbour, which is my main base, I have lots of friends.、Hmm. Where are you off to next? I'm going to make my way along a canal called the Canal du Midi, all the way inland up to Toulouse. I've been at sea for a while already this year, so I fancy a change. The Canal du Midi isn't that a World Heritage site? Yes, it was opened in 1681 and took 15 years to build. It cuts across southwest France from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. There must be some beautiful scenery along the way. I think I envy you, Marcel. The scenery is very special. Yes, the canal has a 173 meter long tunnel, and this was the first ever canal tunnel in the world. And let's not forget the reservoir. The Canal du Midi has its own purpose-built lake, which supplies water to the canal. Sounds exciting. Just one last thing. Do you need a license for a boat? Yes. We need two, actually, one for rivers and canals, and the other for the sea. In fact, for the latter, we need to gain a special certificate, and this involves passing some written and practical tests. The rules are much stricter for taking a boat out to sea, as you would imagine. For safety reasons, I'm sure. Thanks, Marcel. It's been a pleasure. Now you will hear the interview again. We're here this morning in the south of France with Marcel Beno. Marcel lives on a boat. Hello there, and thank you for offering to show us your home on water. Hello, welcome aboard. How long have you been living on your boat, Marcel? For the last five and a half years. I've owned several smaller boats in my life. But eight years ago, I decided to sell my house and live full time on the water. It took me a while to get things organised, though. What type of boat is this then? It's called a motor cruiser. It can be used on rivers and canals, and also out at sea. So, from where we are now in the south of France, you can go inland up to Paris, but you could also sail across the Mediterranean and end up in Africa. That's right. Yes. In fact, I was in Cyprus last week. It took me four days to get back. The inside of the boat seems larger than it looks from the outside. So, where we are now, what's this section called? This is the cockpit where we steer the boat, but where we can also enjoy the sights and the sea breeze. It does feel great out here in the open on a sunny day like today. How fast does the boat travel, Marcel? Quicker than you think. It has a modern electronic 300 kilowatt engine, which can propel the boat at up to 34 knots. That's the speed measurement we use for water. That equates to about 64 kilometers per hour on land. What other technology does it have? The boat has a satellite communication system, so I always know exactly where I am at sea. And it has a digital depth finder, so I don't get stuck on the riverbed anywhere. <laughs> And what about things that make life comfortable for you? It has a high-definition television, built-in MP3 player with speakers, central heating, and even air conditioning for when I'm in hot places. 
What about when you are out at sea for days or even weeks at a time? I can store 825 litres of water and 910 litres of fuel. That's enough for more than a month's cruising. And I can see that you have a refrigerator, a gas cooker and even a normal electricity supply, just as you would see in a house. Yes. When I'm back in harbour, I just plug in a cable and that gives me constant electricity. The boat has four batteries, though, so when I'm out on the water, I rely on those. They are rechargeable. The gas is just a portable bottle, like the ones you use for camping. What about the social side of things? Doesn't it get lonely? No, not really. In each harbour or marina, if you are using rivers and canals, there is a lively community of people just like me. The harbours and marinas have shops, restaurants and other places to relax. At this harbour, which is my main base, I have lots of friends. Hmm. Where are you off to next? I'm going to make my way along a canal called the Canal du Midi, all the way inland up to Toulouse. I've been at sea for a while already this year, so I fancy a change. The Canal du Midi? Isn't that a World Heritage Site? Yes, it was opened in 1681 and took 15 years to build. It cuts across southwest France from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. There must be some beautiful scenery along the way. I think I envy you, Marcel. The scenery is very special, yes. The canal has a 173-metre-long tunnel, and this was the first ever canal tunnel in the world. And let's not forget the reservoir. The Canal du Midi has its own purpose-built lake, which supplies water to the canal. Sounds exciting. Just one last thing. Do you need a license for a boat? Yes, we need two, actually. One for rivers and canals, and the other for the sea. In fact, for the latter, we need to gain a special certificate, and this involves passing some written and practical tests. The rules are much stricter for taking a boat out to sea, as you would imagine. For safety reasons, I'm sure. Thanks, Marcel. It's been a pleasure. That is the end of question 8. In a moment you will hear question 9. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 9. Listen to the following interview with the manager of a library and then answer the questions below. You will hear the interview twice. I'm in Oxford this morning and I'm here to meet Hugo McDaniel, who looks after this great library. Hello, Hugo. Hello. Hugo, what a lovely city and, of course, quite a famous city. It's my first visit to Oxford and I'm here for a few days, so perhaps you can give me some hints later about where to go and what to see. Yes, of course. I've lived here all my life, so I should know one or two interesting places. <laughs> There's the university, of course, which has produced 47 Nobel Peace Prize winners and 26 prime ministers. OK. But I'm here to talk to you about the problems that you are experiencing in the library at the moment. But before we get to that, can you tell us a little about the Great Library itself? The original library dates back to 1320, when it was situated in the north of the town. 
but it wasn't until 1620 that the library was established in its present location here. So it's a very old library. Hmm. And not just a single building, right? No. We have 30 separate buildings now in the city, all linked by private footpaths, and the two main departments are linked by an underground tunnel. Fascinating. Hugo, you have an unusual policy about lending out books, don't you? Well, it's simple, really. We don't lend books. Anyone who wants to read one of our books has to do it here, in the library. Even the King of England was refused a book back in 1645. <laughs> I guess that's because you have so many valuable items. You must have rather a lot of books here if they never leave the building. Yes, we have over 12 million books, maps and documents, some of which date back to the time of the pharaohs in ancient Egypt. So yes, we have some very valuable books and manuscripts indeed. And you have another unusual policy, don't you? You mean that we're not allowed to throw any of our books away? By law, we have to store a single copy of all the books published in the UK and Ireland. That's a lot of books. Which brings us to the main problem. Lack of space. Indeed. We have to find space for just over 1,000 books every single day. And quite simply, we've run out of shelf space here in Oxford. And people thought that the internet would kill off the printed word, eh? <laughs> So, what's the solution? We're building a warehouse about 80 kilometres away. It's almost ready and it's huge, housing another 10 million books. Oh. Will you remove books from here then? Actually, we started removing the less popular items a few years ago. We have 2.4 million books stored in a mine. A moisture-free and very dark salt mine in northern England, all awaiting a permanent home. The conditions in the mine help to protect and preserve the books. But yes, we'll also be removing another two million of the least wanted books from here, the library itself. Tell us more about the process of moving this large amount of books, Hugo. We're employing around 150 people. We need people who can operate machinery such as cranes and lifting devices and to drive trucks to carry the books. And then we need people to recatalogue every single book and put them all on the new shelves. Mm. So how are the books catalogued? Each book has a unique barcode. So they all need to be scanned into a database and then relocated in the warehouse. We'll do this by size of book and not by subject. So we could easily have a book on fishing stored on a shelf next to a book on astrophysics. This will be quite different to the way that the books are shelved in a regular library. And what does the warehouse look like inside? Very modern. Almost like a space station. It's temperature controlled, has constant low level lighting, and the moisture levels are kept very low. Will people be able to visit the warehouse and read the books there? No. If a particular book is required, we will arrange for it to be delivered here within 48 hours. Sounds like a challenge, Hugo. And all because you can't throw any old books away. Yes, but it's not going to be a solution forever. We calculate that if the same number of new books arrive each year from now on, the new warehouse will be full in around 18 years, and then we'll have to build another one. Unless you start scanning books into computers, Hugo, and create digital copies, that would take up far less space. That approach has been discussed, and of course there are plenty of digital books out there now, but we decided that we just couldn't destroy any of our books and replace them with digital copies. Some of them are really old, many are famous, and others are just beautiful.
Now you will hear the interview again. I'm in Oxford this morning, and I'm here to meet Hugo McDaniel, who looks after this great library. Hello, Hugo. Hello. Hugo, what a lovely city, and of course, quite a famous city. It's my first visit to Oxford, and I'm here for a few days. So perhaps you can give me some hints later about where to go and what to see. Yes, of course. I've lived here all my life, so I should know one or two interesting places. <laughs> There's the university, of course, which has produced forty-seven Nobel Peace Prize winners and twenty-six prime ministers. Okay, but I'm here to talk to you about the problems that you are experiencing in the library at the moment. But before we get to that. Can you tell us a little about the Great Library itself? The original library dates back to 1320, when it was situated in the north of the town. But it wasn't until 1620 that the library was established in its present location here. So it's a very old library.、Mm. And not just a single building, right? No, we have 30 separate buildings now in the city. All linked by private footpaths, and the two main departments are linked by an underground tunnel. Fascinating, Hugo. You have an unusual policy about lending out books, don't you? Well, it's simple, really. We don't lend books. Anyone who wants to read one of our books has to do it here in the library. Even the King of England was refused a book back in 1645. <laughs> I guess that's because you have so many valuable items. You must have rather a lot of books here if they never leave the building. Yes, we have over twelve million books, maps, and documents, some of which date back to the time of the pharaohs in ancient Egypt. So yes, we have some very valuable books and manuscripts indeed. And you have another unusual policy, don't you? You mean that we're not allowed to throw any of our books away? By law, we have to store a single copy of all the books published in the UK and Ireland. That's a lot of books, which brings us to the main problem: lack of space. Indeed, we have to find space for just over one thousand books every single day, and quite simply, we've run out of shelf space here in Oxford. And people thought that the internet would kill off the printed word, eh? <laughs> so, what's the solution? We're building a warehouse about eighty kilometers away. It's almost ready, and it's huge, housing another ten million books. Oh, will you remove books from here then? Actually, we started removing the less popular items a few years ago. We have 2.4 million books stored in a mine, a moisture-free and very dark salt mine in northern England, all awaiting a permanent home. The conditions in the mine help to protect and preserve the books, but yes, we'll also be removing another two million of the least wanted books from here, the library itself. Tell us more about the process of moving this large amount of books, Hugo. We're employing around 150 people. We need people who can operate machinery such as cranes and lifting devices, and to drive trucks to carry the books. And then we need people to recatalog every single book and put them all on the new shelves.、Mm. So, how are the books catalogued? Each book has a unique barcode. So they all need to be scanned into a database and then relocated in the warehouse. We'll do this by size of book and not by subject. So we could easily have a book on fishing stored on a shelf next to a book on astrophysics. This will be quite different to the way that the books are shelved in a regular library. And what does the warehouse look like inside? Very modern. Almost like a space station, it's temperature controlled, has constant low-level lighting, and the moisture levels are kept very low. Will people be able to visit the warehouse and read the books there? No, 
If a particular book is required, we will arrange for it to be delivered here within 48 hours. Sounds like a challenge, Hugo. And all because you can't throw any old books away. Yes, but it's not going to be a solution forever. We calculate that if the same number of new books arrive each year from now on, the new warehouse will be full in around 18 years. And then we'll have to build another one. Unless you start scanning books into computers, Hugo, and create digital copies, that would take up far less space. That approach has been discussed, and of course there are plenty of digital books out there now. But we decided that we just couldn't destroy any of our books and replace them with digital copies. Some of them are really old, many are famous, and others are just beautiful. That is the end of question 9. In a moment, you will hear question 10. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 10. Listen to the following talk about an agency that looks for unusual artists, and then answer the following questions. You will hear the talk twice. I have been involved in the art world for over 20 years. I began by teaching in secondary schools, but for the last 10 years I've been working as an art lecturer in a local college. Recently, I've been occupied with something different. I've established a new agency for artists, and I'm here today to talk about the project. It's called Unusual Artists. At college, I deliver lectures about art history, and because I like the practical side of art as well, I offer one-to-one -one lessons in drawing and painting. Ganesh was my first student. At fifty years of age, he was also my oldest one, and he was so keen to learn and improve his art skills. Ganesh's life history amazed me. He had worked all his life as an engineer on a production line. A few years ago, he needed brain surgery, and while he was recovering, his wife suggested he take up drawing. He told her that he'd never been interested in art, at school or afterwards, and didn't think he had any talent at all. However, he was bored, so he gave it a go, and was amazed to discover that he had hidden art skills, and could sketch pretty much anything he saw. His first picture was an excellent drawing, and a very accurate one too. It happens quite rarely, but surgery has been known to change a person's attitude and even develop previously unknown skills. Ganesh stopped being an engineer, took a degree in art, and is now a successful professional artist, all within five years of his surgery. Meeting Ganesh made me think that there must be others out there who are beginners in the art world but have come to it in unusual and different ways. So I started my agency last year. Right now, we've signed up more than 30 up-and-coming artists, all of them coming from an unusual art background. We also have Petra, who for years worked in a court of law. 
She used to make handwritten notes of all the court proceedings, a kind of scribe, so she felt her listening skills were excellent. But then one day last year, when the court was quiet, she started to sketch the people around her. A colleague saw the results and told her about the need for court artists who get paid to sketch the various people who appear in a courtroom. Cameras are not allowed in courts in this country, of course. Petra is now working with the Unusual Artists Agency to improve her speed of sketching, and we're also helping her to secure work in the city courts. The others are all equally amazing. We've produced a leaflet of their life stories, which I hope will inform people and perhaps inspire them to develop their own artistic talents. It's on display at the back of the room. That's all from me for now. I'm happy to talk to you individually if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Now you will hear the talk again. I have been involved in the art world for over 20 years. I began by teaching in secondary schools, but for the last 10 years I've been working as an art lecturer in a local college. Recently I've been occupied with something different. I've established a new agency for artists, and I'm here today to talk about the project. It's called unusual artists. At college I deliver lectures about art history and because I like the practical side of art as well I offer one-to-one -one lessons in drawing and painting. Ganesh was my first student. At 50 years of age he was also my oldest one and he was so keen to learn and improve his art skills. Ganesh's life history amazed me. He had worked all his life as an engineer on a production line. A few years ago, he needed brain surgery, and while he was recovering, his wife suggested he take up drawing. He told her that he'd never been interested in art, at school or afterwards, and didn't think he had any talent at all. However, he was bored. So he gave it a go, and was amazed to discover that he had hidden art skills, and could sketch pretty much anything he saw. His first picture was an excellent drawing, and a very accurate one too. It happens quite rarely, but surgery has been known to change a person's attitude, and even develop previously unknown skills. Ganesh stopped being an engineer, took a degree in art, and is now a successful professional artist, all within five years of his surgery. Meeting Ganesh made me think that there must be others out there who are beginners in the art world, but have come to it in unusual and different ways. So I started my agency last year. Right now, we've signed up more than 30 up-and-coming artists, all of them coming from an unusual art background. We also have Petra, who for years worked in a court of law. She used to make handwritten notes of all the court proceedings, a kind of scribe, so she felt her listening skills were excellent. But then one day last year, when the court was quiet, she started to sketch the people around her. A colleague saw the results and told her about the need for court artists who get paid to sketch the various people who appear in a courtroom. Cameras are not allowed in courts in this country, of course. Petra is now working with the Unusual Artists Agency to improve her speed of sketching, and we're also helping her to secure work in the city courts. 
The others are all equally amazing. We've produced a leaflet of their life stories, which I hope will inform people and perhaps inspire them to develop their own artistic talents. It's on display at the back of the room. That's all from me for now. I'm happy to talk to you individually if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. That is the end of question 10, and of the test. In a moment, your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, please collect all the papers. Thank you, everyone.